I hope that everybody enjoyed uh, some uh, sustenance for the body, and now we'll turn to uh, intellectual food for our uh, consciousnesses and maybe even something beyond that. I'm uh, very grateful to you all for being here, and I would like to reintroduce, although I've given their full biographies before, uh, immediately to my left, Professor Ruth Gavison of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, pioneer in the creation of civil rights organizations in Israel, leading public intellectual in Israel, working on questions of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state, person with strongly expressed and strongly held views that have had a major impact in the public sphere uh, on these crucial questions. Um, and then to, to her left, Professor Malika Zahal, here, professor here at Harvard's Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations Department, which incidentally is the department that trained me as an undergraduate. So I'm especially uh, grateful to have, uh, to have a de that department uh, represented here. Um, professor Zahal's work is on the contemporary uh, Middle East and specifically on Islamist movements and their relationships to the state. She's argued very powerfully and convincingly that the state must be brought into an analysis that all too often has focused on an opposition between Islamist parties and organizations and the state itself. She's throughout her work emphasized the very complex interplay of those relationships and I would say it's fair to say that she's reshaped the orthodoxy of the field as a consequence. Um, the topic is self-consciously a comparative one here. We're interested in exploring similarities and differences and having the kind of conversation about these questions that is challenging outside the realm of excellent scholars who are generous in their mutual willingness to engage beyond the narrow boundaries of their individualized areas of expertise. So to ask a scholar to do that is to ask the greatest act of generosity and bravery that a scholar can perform. And I'm very excited that uh, both Ruth and Malika have uh, volunteered to do exactly that. The way we'll proceed is that I'll ask Ruth first to make some initial comments, then I'll ask Malika to make some initial comments, and then the conversation will proceed from there. And with any luck, uh, you will hear as little from me as possible. Ruth, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here in the inauguration of this new center. Thanks to uh, all that made this uh, possible. Uh, I feel that I here represent the Israel part of the new center. And uh, uh, since I understand from the way the discussion is structured that we are going to spend most of the time on a very important subject that I've worked on quite a bit, which is the role of religion in modern states, Islam, Judaism, in Israel, Tunisia, respectively, I would like to spend my uh, first few minutes on explaining uh, why the situation in Israel is not only, and maybe not even mainly, about religion. Because I think Can you that say that again just because somebody sneezed? Uh, mainly? I said that the case of the Jewishness of Israel is not only, and maybe not even primarily, about religion, but it's about the self-government of Jews and creating the only place in the world in which Jews are a majority. They're not a minority community living in a host society, and they are reviving themselves in their ancient homeland or part thereof in an attempt to recreate a life of full responsibility for all aspects of life, including control over territory, and responsibility for what happens on this territory, including the welfare of non-Jews living in that territory. So I think Israel is about that. And the fact that once there is Israel, there is a debate in it about the role of religion in the state is, of course, very central. But Israel is about that. I'm happy that Mr. Boyarin uh, uh, helped us see that even in ancient times, Judaism was not only a religion, it was a whole way of life. In any event, so I think, I th and I think that this perception of Israel actually is something that can be a focus of study, which is very important, because I think Israel in this sense is saying something that is very critical to modern democracies. Because Israel has three commitments. 
It's not only Jewish and democratic, it's a mistake. It's a false binary. It's Jewish, democracy, human rights. It's a democratic state that accepts a commitment to universal values, humanism, human rights, but also accepts and declares unashamedly that it's not a neutral democracy. It is a democracy that is committed to the special welfare of a particular collective. Now, the nature of this collective, only religion, religion and people, only a people, blah, 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 is of a great debate within among Jews. But the idea of the state of Israel is that unlike many other states, especially modern Western democracies, that pride themselves to be only the states of their civic nation, Israel is a state that concedes a tension between the demos, which includes many non-Jews and doesn't include all Jews, and the collective, the people for whom this state is the locus of self-determination. And I think this means that Israel has a very interesting relationship to Jewish religion. Because Israel is a culmination of Zionism. Zionism is modern nationalism. Nationalism in Europe and among the Jews is a response of collectives to secularization. It's a response to the loss of bonds of solidarity of old collectives. And Zionism, as you, <laughs> Jewish nationalism, was an attempt to save both Jews from persecution, bam, 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 and Judaism from the sense of assimilation in emancipated, enlightened state, and the kind of pressure to convert in other countries. So Zionism is a statement that it's bad for Jews and Judaism to always live as a minority. It's bad for Jews and Judaism, especially when the bonds of religion are loosened by secularization. And in order for Jews to be able to maintain the importance to them of having access to their Jewishness, at least some of the Jews need to full, live a full Jewish life, the kind of life that Jews lived in biblical times, where they controlled a piece of territory and lived as an independent people in their land. So this is Zionism. Now, Jewish law didn't like Zionism much. Most of Jewish law was anti-Zionist terribly. There were some religious Zionists, not many. Now, clearly, Jews were maintaining the diaspora only because of religion. They couldn't have maintained. But once they started being also secular Jews, the bonds of religion were weakened. And Jews, many of them, still wanted to remain Jews. Now, the answer for Jews who want to remain Jews without being religious is not simple, as we all know, including Jews living in this country. And Zionism is not the only solution for such Jews, but it's a solution. And it created the state of Israel. Now, many people in Israel are saying, yes, Israel, this Jewish and Democratic is now part of Israeli foundational law, and there is an initiative to have a law declaring that Israel is a nation state of Jews. And I was asked by the then Minister of Justice to recommend on that. And I recommended that there would be no legislation. I think it's a bad idea to legislate this. But these issues predate the state, and they are issues about the relationships between state and societies, not only in Israel, all over the place. Because I want to argue that states are instruments. We're not fascists. States are not for states' sake. States are for the welfare of individuals and groups. And the uniqueness of Israel and other states that define themselves in terms of non-civic identity, they don't privatize all non-civic identities. The uniqueness of Israel is that it gives a response 
or tries to give a response to a problem of many Western democracy, which is the fact that the civic nation, the demos, doesn't have enough solidarity. The natural bond of solidarity are weakened because they're not also primordial. They're only civic. Bela's civil religion, the constitution is not enough to sustain the efforts, the angers, the frustrations. We heard about Trump. I think Trump comes in here too. Democracy is not a universal idea like human rights. Democracy is the idea of solidarity of a demos. And when a demos doesn't feel solidarity, when there is no feeling that the government of the demos is a serving elite, then the demos becomes populistic and revolts. And maybe this is part of what we are seeing. So Israel is a place that said, we A, need to bring Jews into a place where they are a majority, and we are going to recreate a society which has this solidarity. It's not only individualistic. Judaism is beautiful in having great respect for individuals, but also insisting that they are part of peoples, of groups. There is a responsibility to a collective. And Israel stands for that. And I think this is something that many Western democracies need to think about, about how to recreate civic solidarity in situations in which the, the countries, the societies living in countries are multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multicultural, and the civic bonds are not enough and the other bonds become divisive. How does Western democracy deal with it if its only answer is privatization? Now, with Israel, of course, there is a problem because once you do that, you mean that you don't privatize that, you make tensions more visible. Tension between Jews and Arabs, secular and religious, and all the spectrum of, all of these become more visible when you concede that there is a public place for these identities. But I think, and I argue, and this is why I think Israel not only is, in a sense, a Jewish and democratic state committed to human rights, but should be that, not only for the Jews, but also for the Arabs, because this is an element of the strength, of the raison d'etre of this society. Israel would not have been established if Jews didn't want a place of their own. When the United Nations in 29, this month, 1947, decided that in mandatory Palestine there will be a Jewish state and an Arab state, Arab, not Muslim, not Christian, not Palestinian, Arab state, it demanded that both states will be democratic and respect the human rights of all, and of the group of the other people that will remain in their territory. So the United Nations understood that it wasn't an inconsistency, like some people in Israel say, it can't be both Jewish and democratic, it might choose either Jewish or democratic, and some people say that. No. In order for it to be a strong society and democratic, you must have a Jewish majority that wants Israel to be the place where Jews don't discriminate against non-Jews, but exercise their power to debate freely with political responsibility what kind of a Jewish state they will create. And in order to do that, you need Israel to be a reinforcement of democracy and Judaism. Now, this reinforcement between Judaism, democracy, and human rights is imminent. And this is, again, something that I think is generalized. We see, I mean, the, the states, the Sykes-Picot states in the Middle East are collapsing because the non-civic identities are much stronger. Now, this is within Islam, and this is within ethnic groups, Turks and Kurds. And it's, it's bloody, it's terrible. And this is because we don't understand 
how states are important as agents for democracy and human rights, and how they cannot ignore the tensions between parts of their population. So what I'm saying is that Israel is the place, it's Jewish in the important sense, that it is the place where Jews of all sorts and all attitudes to their heritage and religion are creating a majority Jewish community in which they will grant full civil and political rights to non-Jews living in the country, but they will then debate as a responsible social and political group the kind of relationships between the state that they have and their tradition and their commitment to human rights and their democracy and all these issues should be democratically and freely debated and resolved in the country that is defined by the fact that the commitment to self-determination of Jews is a central commitment along with democracy and human rights for all. Malika. Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank um, Martha Minow, uh, congratulate the Julius family for the inauguration of the center, and thank you, Noah, for um, including me in this very, very interesting conversation and um, starting the comparative work here that is so important and necessary in my view. I, I want to say that um, the remarks I'm going to make, in fact, um, have been facilitated by my reading of Ruth Gavison's article, uh, Can Israel Be Both Jewish and Democratic? I was working on the um, constituent um, assembly debate uh, in Tunisia that took place between 2012 and 2014, and this was exactly the question that um, were part uh, of the deliberation of Tunisian drafters uh, between uh, 2012 and 2014, how can we be a Muslim and democratic state? Uh, so um, I read uh, the article by Ruth Gavison with a comparison in mind. And what I'll do is uh, start with a, a few comments about um, Islam and democracy in uh, the Middle East, and then I'll move to the Tunisian case because I think it's a, an exceptional case in the Middle East, in a way an exceptional case like Israel, and that they share um, a lot of resemblances, in particular in the way they grapple with this idea of being uh, related to religion as states and being democratic at the same time. So in fact, most Middle Eastern states uh, claim a special relationship with religion. Israel defines itself as a Jewish state, and most Arab states in the Middle East constitutionally claim also that the religion of the state is Islam. So you will find an establishment clause uh, in all the constitutions of the Middle East. And an important number of Middle Eastern countries, Arab Middle Eastern countries, also state that Sharia law is a or the source of legislation. On the other hand, a uh, few of the current Middle Eastern states can seriously claim to be democratic in the very minimal sense that they hold free and fair elections, that can lead to alternation to power, have a free press or other forms of meaning meaningful counter powers. And I insist on the word minimal here. I could also use the term procedural democracy. So Israel conforms to that definition and after the Arab Spring, uh, Tunisia can be considered today a state that is democratic in that sense as well. So these two cases, the case of Tunisia and Israel, uh, from that uh, point of view are exceptions. And what is interesting here is that they also display resemblances to each other in regard to the fact that they both grapple with uh, to um, inescapable necessities that they want to make work uh, together. One, a um, state religion or a tight relationship between the state and a religion, and two, a democracy. And so the issue for both of them, and I insist in very different contexts, the context cannot be more different, um, is how can they be Jewish or Muslim and democratic? And does their respective Jewishness and Muslimness 
preclude the democratic character of their regimes and to what extent? So this is exactly the same question, although of course the history is completely different. So the Tunisian state's history is much more longer than that of the state of Israel. They both uh, nonetheless asserted their sovereignty in the middle of the 20th century as independent states. And their Jewishness and Muslimness were part of this assertion. And I think it's safe to say that in both cases, there was a very strong agreement um, in Israel and in Tunisia about uh, this relationship between state and religion. This was not something that was put into question, I think, uh, from the very beginning. So for instance, Tunisia in 1956, the year of their, of their independence, refused, did not want to have a secular state, um, and they reaffirmed the Muslimness of their state as they had in fact continuously done in their constitutional history since 1857. And um, Israel, uh, founded as a Jewish state and a democracy, um, therefore has had this feature of being a democratic state much longer than uh, Tunisia, of course. And as I said, the circumstances of their sovereign emergence are also extremely different. So um, I want to insist nonetheless that in spite of um, those um, differences, um, we see very, very tense and important internal debates in both cases about what the Jewishness of the state or the Muslimness of the state mean. And I want to even go further. I want to also argue that these debates are not necessarily debates that are specific. So I'm going a little bit um, in the opposite side um, of your argument here. So these debates are not specific to states that claim to have a religion. Um, in fact, it's also the problem of states such as the French state which defines itself as secular and defines Frenchness as a religious. So as soon as you have a state that's very prescriptive about what it means to be Tunisian, Israeli, French, et cetera, et cetera, as, so, as, as, as soon as you don't have, do not have neutrality culturally, ideologically, et cetera, then you get in trouble, right? And French secularism, therefore, can also be seen to be in contradiction with democratic principles. And this has been the object of vehement contentions as well. So I'm not saying here that the French state is not democratic or that Israel is not democratic or that Tunisia is not democratic. They're all democratic, but they all have problems uh, recon reconciliating this democracy with other claims they make. And in that sense, they have been able to continue to exist, and I hope this will be the case for Tunisia as democratic states, but they will also have to grapple with this problem, and the way they respond to that problem is interesting to follow because if they can survive while continuing to grapple with this problem, then they will continue to be strong democracies. Um, so the, the, for me here, therefore, if we um, get a little bit out of the historical context, I think the problems are very similar when we compare, for instance, um, these three countries. Now, how did the Tunisians grapple with that question? I think it's interesting to go back to the particular case of Tunisia. Um, how did they grapple with that difficulty of becoming democratic while remaining Muslim? How were they able to diffuse the enormous tensions that this question created? Um, what solutions did they provide to such a problem? And how did they make it as coherent as possible? This is a problem. How do I make it coherent? How do I make it work? Um, so um, let me summarize very, very quickly. The, the, it took two years for the constituents in Tunisia to come up with a constitution that was more or less acceptable uh, by everyone. Uh, so I'm going to summarize in, in two minutes what happened. And of course, we can talk a little bit more during the Q&A and the conversation, of course. So first, um, a very important um, element. The Tunisian drafters, um, after long debates, decided not to include Sharia law in the Constitution. So um, they avoided including a clause that would state that Sharia law was or is the source of legislation, as in Egypt, for instance. And um, in fact, the Islamist party uh, and Nahda uh, decided to compromise on that. So it was 
an achievement uh, to come to that. And I can talk later about the reasons why they accepted to compromise. They faced very strong resistances from uh, more liberal parties and from civil society. And they decided to let go of Sharia law in the constitution um, at the cost of alienating the more conservative wing of the party. Um, and they also reasoned, which is very interesting during the deliberations that Tunisia could be a Muslim state without Sharia law. That in fact, they didn't need to constitutionalize Sharia law in order for the state to be Muslim. Now, the drafters also decided to maintain an old article, um, Article 1, that was uh, part of the Constitution of 1959, and that says the following. Tunisia is a free, independent, and sovereign state. Its language is Arabic. Its religion is Islam, and its regime is the Republic. So during the deliberations, there was no agreement, no consensus, whether this article meant that Islam was the religion of Tunisia, because it says its religion is Islam after having cited Tunisia and the state. So people did not agree if Islam was the religion of Tunisia, of the Tunisian people, or of the state. And of course, it makes all the difference. But what they prefer to do in the end is not open that Pandora box, just to leave it the way it was. And they just added uh, right after that article that this article cannot be changed. <laughs> <laughs> so Article 1 has become uh, some sort of a relic that nobody wants to touch. Because if you touch it, then you know uh, things open up and it becomes very complicated. But it's very important to say that, yes, they reach a consensus of not including Sharia law and keeping Article 1. But the discussions were extremely tense. So um, the Tunisian process is often represented in a very rosy way, very um, um, consensual. It was not consensual. So in order to get to that consensus, um, they had to really um, have very, very long debates, very long disputes. Uh, so it was uh, quite tense at many moments um, in the process. So uh, we delay things for later. We'll see how it will work, um, perhaps with constitutional court uh, and tribunals later. But we prefer not to say uh, too much about it. So in particular, with this Article 1, it was not clear how the issue of religious minorities would be dealt with. Uh, the Constitution guarantees equality and freedom for all. But with this article, of course, we still have the same blind spot as we had with the 1959 Constitution about religious minorities, right? The, there is another article, for instance, that states that the president of the republic must be a Muslim, right? So this, for me, contradicts uh, the idea of equality. Um, between all citizens of Tunisia. Today, there are around uh, 1,500 Jews in Tunisia. And um, it has remained a blind spot. It hasn't been really deeply discussed in the deliberations. And Tunisians uh, often act as if uh, it was not a problem. And for me, that's a problem. So uh, to make the state Muslim and democratic, is, of course, feasible in that particular case. Uh, they did it, yes. Is it coherent? Not entirely, right? Uh, so here, there is a first blind spot. Then, um, although the Tunisian uh, drafters did not discuss um, in depth the status of religious minorities uh, in Tunisia, they discussed at length the issues of intra-Muslim differences. So in Tunisia, um, Tunisian Muslims live their Muslimness in many different ways. Some people are very conservative, others are very liberal, some practice, some don't. And so um, there were problems about how are we going to live together while practicing very different types of Islam. And so the drafters came with a very long article, Article 6, that tried to guarantee for every type of Muslim way of life, uh, certain limits that they could not go beyond, um, beyond which they could not go. So let me read the Article 6. It's a very long article, and it's an article that reflects the contortions that the drafters made in order to ensure to all um, types of ways of life 
to exist um, together. So this is what it says. The state is the custodian of the religion, which is Islam. It guarantees freedom of belief, freedom of conscience, and of religious worship. It ensures the neutrality of mosques and places of worship and protects them from partisan instrumentalization. The state shall commit to spreading the values of moderation and tolerance, to protecting sacred things or the sacred, and to preventing attacks on them. It shall also commit to prohibit takfir, which is accusations of apostasy, and incitements to hatred and violence and to confronting them. So here the state has a lot of things to do. First, it is the custodian of Islam. So this means that the state is the custodian of religious institutions, mosques, religious education, public schools, uh, sorry, religious education in public schools, pilgrimage. It finances them, it sustains them, but also, of course, it controls them, it regulates them. So it means that the state can also shape religious pedagogies, uh, religious narratives, religious discourses. And this is, in a way, the minimum basis on which all the drafters agree, the custodianship of Islam by the state. Now, um, the second part of Article 6 is interesting. Why? Because it protects society from extremists on both sides. So first, the extremists who are liberals and secularists who want to um, behave publicly in contradiction with Muslim values. Uh, and on the other side, extremist Islamists, for instance, who accuse uh, other Muslims of apostasy, right? <laughs> but um, what is interesting in this article is that it gave guarantees to these two constituencies without explicitly limiting the freedom of each one in one direction or the other, right? It didn't say what were the limits of the liberties of each constituency. So because it did not um, specify those limits, um, again, the problem was not settled, and we can imagine it will be settled in courts and in the future constitutional court that will be established hopefully uh, soon. So both Articles 1 and Article 6, in fact, deferred interpretative issues for future adjudication in courts of law and also in future public arena debates. And what you can see here is that, uh, yes, the Constitution was proclaimed. We all arrived at a nice, beautiful consensus, but there will be problems in the future, that's for sure. So, sure. yes, um, there is a lack of clarity. There is ambiguity because the situation is far from being settled. Um, it has been um, done this way with ambiguity and a lack of clarity because we needed consensus. Consensus is important for a democratic transition. Um, but is the price too high? Um, is the price uh, too high in the sense that if there is instability in the near future, then the delayed problems are going to become worse? Uh, is that a pay we can, we can, is that a price we will have to pay in the future? Um, second question, uh, there has not been an honest recognition of the price paid by religious minorities uh, now and in the future. Um, and is it uh, feasible in the end uh, to build a Muslim and democratic state? Yes, again, it is feasible. They have done it. Um, is it coherent? Again, uh, my response is in the Tunisian case, not entirely. There are blind spots, there are contradictions, there are problems. Um, sorry? Yeah, Tunisia, sorry. Um, and is it the best we could do in Tunisia at the moment? Yes, but I believe we clearly have a lot of work to do uh, to make it better. Thank you, thank you for both presentations. Okay, Ruth, please. Well, I congratulate you. I think it is a great achievement. And uh, I, want you to, I want to say that uh, you have achieved some things that we have not yet achieved. We, for instance, don't have a constitution in mm -hmm. which these things are in this way regulated. And I'm not sure it's bad. 
But you see, we do have a Declaration of Independence which mm -hmm. does that. Yeah. And in fact, because most of the Zionists initially were secular and some were even anti-religious, mm -hmm. the kind of compromise that they reached was to stress the Jewishness of the people, the self-determination, the history, the Bible, the connection to the land, and not religion. So there is no mention of established religion. Mm -hmm. Actually, not only is there not a mention of established religion, Israel inherited the millet system. And in principle, in constitutional principle, the three religions are all equal in status. I mean, in fact, of course, the Jews are the majority, and they have institutions, mm -hmm. and they are more, have you know, schools financed by the state. But in principle, there is no established church in Israel. And there is a, well, there was a debate about. Or there are multiple. I mean, that's the definition of the millet. Or there, either there's none, or there are multiple. Yes, but we have, I think you have two probably. We have religious monopoly over marriage and divorce, but for yes. all religious communities. Mm -hmm. So then this is not any concern. But anyway, we don't have a constitution. And among other things, we don't have a constitution because we couldn't reach the agreement that is required in order to define in preambles mm -hmm. the principles that you have codified. Yes. But let me tell you, the fact that we don't and you do is not going to change at all the way you're going to proceed. And the, the Americans have the First Amendment. It's not a great help. I mean, they have <laughs> issues all the time. <laughs> I might so, disagree with you there. But, uh, but. Well, <laughs> we're going to enjoy here the comparative aspects. Yeah, no, it's good. <laughs> anyway, anyway, no, issues do arise all yes. the time. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, I told you, uh, uh, um, uh, you can control when and the intensity to which. And it depends when you, you understand, as you do now, that you need it. And when you think that you are, you can afford to start fighting. And since you are still very fragile, my expectation is that since you want this to succeed, and we all hope it will mm -hmm. succeed, then you will find the ways to avoid the issues. Mm -hmm. And we will not have to raise them in this particular moment. And when you're stronger and the feelings mm -hmm. of solidarity are stronger, you can deal with those, including the religious minorities. I think it's very important in these things to remember that it's not only principles. Mm -hmm. A lot depend on numbers. The ultra-religious in Israel are now a very powerful and pretty dangerous mm -hmm. element in Israeli society because they are strong. They have a lot of political power. They are necessary for all effective governments especially because the left needs them, because it cannot rely on matters of war and peace on the Arab minority. So it's a, it's a rich, tricky issue. And they are doing things that are very bad in terms of religious and coercion and things like that that are very, very dangerous, just because they have this political power. But your religious minorities are, at the moment, not very powerful. Mm -hmm. And since they're not powerful, they may be happy to have full civil and political rights, freedom of association, freedom of worship, freedom of religion. That's OK. You immediately, because you're a purist, you want them to be totally equal. And I think that if you want to do that, then you're running into an inconsistency. But you don't have to do that. It's like you know we have a very large Arab minority in Israel. They resent the fact that this is a Jewish state, and rightly so. It's not surprising. But the fact that Israel insists, and I think rightly so, that despite the fact that they are not expected to be Zionists and not expected to like the idea that this is a Jewish state, that they are required to accept it is the fact that, as I was saying before, this is the raison d'etre of the country, and the welfare of the Arab minority depends to a large extent, on the stability that is reached by the fact that the Jewish majority agrees that in order to maintain their national home, they have to be democratic, they have to give civil and political rights, they have to be decent, they have to make the Arab minority a full stakeholder 
in the society, despite the fact that days of rest and the flag and the hymn and many other symbols are not fully including them. Yes, it's a problem. But if Israel had tried to be neutral, it would have been more of a problem, including to the welfare of the Arab minority. And this, I think, is a very, very critical point. Now, you said, and this was fascinating, this ambiguity about the state or society mm -hmm. being Muslim. It's very, and I think you were quite right in suggesting, and I think this is a point about all these countries, you're quite right, it's true about, it's not, if you don't privatize religion or ethnic, mm -hmm. it's the same, you're right, mm -hmm. in this sense it's the same. Religion is special in many ways, but it is the same. But I think it's very important, and you said it, that what we do, and I think part of our success, and part of, I hope, your success is, that it's a mistake to present Jewish and democratic, or Muslim and democratic, or French and democratic, as opposites. Because if they're opposites, it's a zero-sum game. If it's more democratic, it's less Jewish. If it's more Jewish, it's less democratic. It doesn't work that way. Remember, there is also human rights. Human rights are universal. They don't necessarily come from the demos. Many times the demos wants actually to <laughs> limit the human rights of minorities or people who are not the demos, immigrants. So in order to have a society that it is a strong demos, protect human rights, you can't tell them human rights are enforced on you by the international community. A, the international community is not powerful enough, and B, no one wants to be governed by others. They want to be governed, but they want to be good because they are good, not because someone else forces them to be good. Human nature. We, we also want to be good ourselves, to struggle and choose the good over evil, not to be programmed to be good. Crocker orange is not our ideal. We want, so, so, so I think that you're right that ultimately the strength of your community depends on the consensus that in some sense you're all Muslims or mostly Muslims and that Islam has the potential of supporting democracy and human rights and liberalism and you're starting to do it, it's a, a lot of debates, with accepting that there are many ways of doing Islam. Mm -hmm. Israel actually is not that successful in this. It's mm -hmm. still struggling quite hard with the legitimacy of many ways of being Jewish. But, but so, so I, I, I completely agree with you. It can be, not only can it be, the strengthening of democracy and solidarity will go together with an internal struggle about the nature of Islam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And since you own Islam all in a different way, then you can have a say on what Islam is, should be, and can be. Do, so, you, wanna, do you wanna respond, Malika? Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think, I think the process, the democratic process, and the commitment uh, to have, at the same time, Islam and democracy, whatever Islam means, right? Uh, made the discussion about what Islam is more profound than it was before, right? So it has, in a way, strengthened the democratic debate about Islam in the public arena, right? Which was very healthy. That being said, I don't think it's just a question of numbers when we look at the question of minorities, because of course, there are the religious minorities, and they can be very small, but there are also the minorities within the majority, and there are also the issues of conversion. So I was thinking this morning about this article stating that the president of the republic has to be a Muslim. What if suddenly people um, decided that to be a Muslim is to be a good Muslim, and what is a good Muslim, right? So the issue of minority is not just a question of numbers, it's also a question that interests Muslims themselves, right? Uh, because there are minorities within the majority and in a way you have very different ways to create minorities. And I'm thinking ethnic major minorities as well, such as Berbers. Um, the constitution, by the way, also says that Tunisia has an Islamic and Arab identity, right? And after the Arab Spring, we've seen Berbers um, coming out and speaking the language. Right, which, is very, which was very surprising because it had been completely suppressed. 
before. Um, so this issue of minority is for me an issue of principle beyond can the I, can I just, context just, of the numbers. Just to say something that might be helpful, I mean, a lot rides on how you operationalize the word democracy and how you operationalize mm -hmm. whatever your moving concept is, Islam or Judaism. So, you know, if you're operationalizing democracy to emphasize the self-determination features, and not just of the whole people, but the self-determination of the majority, whoever that happens to be, you get one view. If, on the other hand, you operationalize democracy to focus on the implicit liberal part of that, and you treat the rights as part of democracy, then you get a different picture mm -hmm. in which the incompatibility that Malika is describing mm -hmm. rises. So a lot of it will turn on how you operationalize. I, I, I want to, I want to, I, I have a comment and a question. Okay. Because I think this is fascinating. I said, and I think you have to concede that, that democracy is a demos, it's a particular demos. It's not universal, it's a particular demos. Now I want so to ask you- So you have to define you, who is in the demos. Yes, but- You can't just say it's I, X person and not Y person. You need a theory of why. Demos is the citizens of the state. In Israel, the demos is all and only Israeli citizens. Equal citizenship to the Arabs and the Jews, all and only the citizens. This is the definition. I don't know. It's not a bad definition. It's, it's acceptable definition. I want to ask you, because it's, it's for, for Islam, it's very interesting. Jews have the lack or the disadvantage that <laughs> there is a coextension between Jews as people and Jews and religion. You have individuals, mm -hmm. I think interesting cases of individuals who are members of the Jewish people and Christians or something like that. But in, as a group, people who are Jews are usually feel that they're members of the Jewish people and also accept relationship to the Jewish law, Jewish tradition, Jewish religion. But, but Arabs and Muslims are, are not that way. They have many ethnic groups and many states and many forms of Islam, and so it's very complicated. Now, how do you deal in Tunisia, in your constitution, as a democracy with forces such as pan-Islam or pan-Arabism? What is the special commitment of Tunisians to Tunisia rather than to ISIS, Khalifat, or pan-Islamism? It's a commitment to Tunisia, to first Tunisia. and foremost, yes. Principally and, to and Tunisia. there is no debate about that. This is, well, there was discussion no. in the preamble committee. There was some discussion about whether Ar pan-Arabism should be invoked in the preamble. Yeah, I mean, you have the, so, but, but it's, it's, really, minor, you know. it's really, it's really an, a, a, part of a political ideology. So the old generation of Pan-Arabists, for instance, would come in and say, oh, we have to be part of the Arab nation, right? But these are very political, political ideologies and not necessarily um, how people deal with being Tunisian. Um, and I think we have a very strong notion of uh, the Tunisian identity, which is um, Tunisian per se. And, and you know, of course, some people would say Tunisia is part of the larger Islamic Ummah or part of the Arab nation, but the constitution really focuses on this Tunisian identity. But yes. Even though, there, even though it's important to note that there are young people who have left Tunisia in non-trivial numbers yes. to go and join the Islamic State, yes. and they probably have a, a different view. It's unclear what they will do when they come home or as they come home. Exactly. So that's but a there very- is, there, they, Some of them may have an alternative view. That's a very interesting question. Why are there so many Tunisian fighters who go to Syria, right? Um, so I don't know the answer, but I think the fact that the Tunisian borders are very porous and that Tunisia has become a democracy and therefore it's very easy to recruit is probably a very important factor. And they have so. some reassurance that they won't be thrown in prison when they come back, necessarily. Probably, yes. You know, unclear. I, 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 in the vein that we were talking before uh -huh. about what to institutionalize and what to leave open is the issue of uh, should the president be Jewish or Muslim? Uh -huh. So you chose to enact this. And Israel did not. There was a debate, uh -huh. and some people said it should be enacted, but it was not. So in principle, it's free for all. Uh -huh. Everyone is eligible. And in fact, one Arab MK, uh, Azmi Bishara, uh, uh, ran for when, when we had the uh, a direct election for prime minister, he presented himself as a candidate for prime minister, and it raised, you know, it wasn't real, I mean, it wasn't going to happen then, but it raised the possibility that this could happen, and it could happen in a sense, because if there was, you know, two candidates that canceled each other out, then the third candidate could possibly win, 
And Israel decided to not enact this. But Ruth, can I ask a question about that? So, you know, in Israel, there are some um, unwritten rules that function almost like constitutional rules that relate to this. So one is, you mentioned it earlier, um, that parties that form the majority in government pledge themselves, this is not written anywhere in a basic law, not to rely on <coughs> seats chosen by Arab voters in order to form a majority for purposes, as you said, for purposes of war and peace. So that's an example of, a, I would guess you would call it a political norm that is not written into any constitutional document. Wouldn't the same be true if, a, if a, an Arab were, were a candidate for president? Most, no. most possibly, you don't think there would be people saying <laughs> that as a symbolic matter, it's not? Well, it's a symbolic matter. You see, this is part of the beauty of the distinction between porous rules like human rights and rules of the game. Now, if a person not born in America cannot be president, then if a person was not born in America, unless there is an amendment, he cannot be a president. No, I, period. Not, I don't think that's clear. I think as an equal protection clause could be interpreted as trumping the, the, the Article 2. Aha, I, don't, I, don't okay. think it's, I don't think it's well, so clear. Some people, you know, have purposive interpretation. Yeah. I mean, I, mean I, I, am a, I, I'm a conservative lawyer. I like positive law. I'm against all this purposive. You want to change the law in this way? Please do amend. <laughs> But, but what's your answer, though, about there is what, a question. What, what, but do you have a view about something like a, a practical political norm, like the one you alluded to, that has, that has a function that arguably could be described as undemocratic from the standpoint of um, it's procedurally democratic. There's no question that it's procedurally democratic, but arguably could be seen as derogating from the equal voice of members of the demos. And in that sense. Yeah. I, I wanted to tell you something else. I mean, uh, you say issues will arise at the Constitutional mm -hmm. Court. Issues will arise and practices will solve them. And practices are much better than Constitutional Courts because they are inherently divisive. Because there someone is right and someone is wrong. This is the right thing. Do deal with the issues as they arise pragmatically. Low visibility is very important. And when you stop, no, 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 it's no, very important. It's, it's very important to do In fact, that. this is how it has been managed. Of course. <laughs> this <laughs> is how it has been managed since 2011. So when something happens and someone is thrown in prison for blasphemy, for instance, well, the person stays a little bit in prison, then pays a very low fine, and then is let go, right? So things are managed in a very, very cautious way because we are in an unstable moment. No, no, I, I want to, to answer you. Okay, good, and then we'll Israel, Israel decided not to enact this on purpose, and the price may be that there is a political situation in which an Arab, indeed, will be eligible and will be elected. It's unlikely, but it may happen, and as far as I understand Israeli society, it will be accepted. He will serve as whatever. So this is very important. And yes, of course, there are many practices that modify the principles of democracy. I don't know, I heard a few things, rumors about how Mr. Sanders was maybe, you know, uh, maybe was helped not to gain more voices in the democratic primaries. Is there a practice like that in this country? Does it mean that the process is not democratic? I think it a lot is. of people think it does. Well, it yeah. does, but nothing is purist and nothing is perfect. And when you have fights for power, it's always ugly. It's always, you know, all this debate about the money and the finances. and the, 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 the. But It's never going to be as pure as the ideals are going to be. And if you don't like that, I don't think that you are for any kind of politics, not democratic and not any other kind. Mitch, Mitch please. Um, so it's very interesting to me that uh, part of the discussions before we wrote for uh, dinner and now after really turn on these conceptual categories, how you define terms, obviously. Uh, you know, law is very much based on taking concepts, defining them, and seeing whether they work in practice. And this idea that you, you came up, that you posed here, that uh, Israel, Jewish, democratic, uh, and humanist, really is
is very interesting because as conceptual categories, it raises a lot of issues in my own mind when I think of, well, okay, if I generalize Jewish, do I mean religion or maybe it's religion, ethnicity, whatever it defines the people historically, et cetera. When I think about um, humanist, I think about the importation of principles that are international into a particular set of borders. And then when you think of democratic, you know, demos, whatever, but you're talking about a, some form of government by which you adhere to certain principles. So when I think about that, and I'm not saying we should be wedded to those to understand Indonesia or to understand Israel, I start, you know, North Korea, uh, not North Korea, South Korea, Japan, right? When we think of Japan, and a lot of us have probably been there, very uh, ethnically homogeneous, although Japanese would say we're diverse. Um, we're democratic, and we are humanists. We, you know, treat people well. But, for example, here's one instance, and I, I it poses questions for Israel or Tunisia. They have, they, they took in, during the time of the Korean War, uh, refugees. They abided by the UN. So they took in uh, a family that I know personally, and the daughter, who's now in her 50s, um, was born in Japan. It took her 40 years to become a Japanese citizen. So they took her into their country, but they did not, until 40 years later, bestow upon her uh, full rights of citizenship. So Japan has, nobody would say Japan is, not, is undemocratic, but they embrace their ethnic homogeneity, as they define it, and they try to balance these things. South Korea, the same thing. Um, it, so I, I, when you look at, at these trade-offs, beyond, I'm sure the Middle East has, you know, is, is something that you might want to, in Europe, in Western uh, governments, you might want to confine yourself to, but there's so many other examples where these trade-offs are constantly being made, and we almost take them for granted that that's okay. It's okay for Japan to treat people that way. It's okay for South Korea to treat people in a certain way. But it's not okay for Tunisia. It's not okay for Israel. How do you, where are the norms? When we accept certain categories and then we understand the inconsistency, who, who is the adjudicator? As you said, outside influence to impose governmental you know, norms is very much resisted as part of national movements. You've seen it historically. Who's supposed to be the adjudicator here? You, you like to write to respond to that one? Well, I think um, it depends if you're talking about constitutions. Uh, are you are you raising the issue of constitutions, or are you raising I'm the problem about more UN largely? Sanctions. If Israel or Tunisia don't doesn't toe the line on certain norms that it developed, I mean, I, for example. So I, I would say, I mean, I think one interesting thing about this is that, as Malika suggests, a lot of it depends on who's the adjudicator in which forum, yeah. right? So you've got, internally, you have a political dimension where there's a political discourse that gives answers. You have an institutional legal dimension where a constitutional court like the one mm -hmm. in South Korea gives answers and is generally listened to. Um, you have also internally the civic society voices, public intellectuals, philosophers who give their own accounts of what's legitimate and who might criticize uh, the arrangements in Japan, for example, by saying they're not fully democratic. Um, then externally, you have another set of institutional actors, and those range from other states that take positions, civic society entities, and then the strange amalgam under international law that is the United Nations, which itself has to be broken into the Security Council, which can do things with bite, and the rest of the United Nations, which is primarily symbolic in terms what of the, the undertakings WHO? that it takes. The WHO, WHO? so, <laughs> exactly. So I mean, a lot of it will depend on the, on the level of analysis. You get a different answer depending where you look. I, I want to complement this because this, I think, is very, very important. Because when we have controversial questions, it's always very important to distinguish between questions, what is the right answer, which is moral, political, and who decides, and in what kind of process. And within domestic national state organizations, usually you have answers, courts, political system, whatever. The international community and, and, and the, the normativity or the legitimacy of these answers depend on the strength of the states 
and their relations with their civil societies, which is critical for the health of states, all states. So the international community, this is its problem. Because it's not clear what kind of solidarity, if at all, there is in the international community. And the norms are very, very difficult to enforce. Because you can see that I mean, in Japan, you have a nice story. She, she was living there. She was safe there. She was fine. She didn't get citizenship. And even when she did get citizenship, she's part of Demos. She's not considered Japanese. This is impossible. She cannot be considered. I'm fine. So. People have different norms. But in Syria, you know, people are dying daily, and it's a total devastation. In the international community, A, it doesn't have a clear answer, and B, even if it had a clear answer, it cannot enforce it. So the problems of part of, I started by saying the states, unlike principles and moralities, are very important. And you get why they're so important when you compare them not to bad states, but to failed states. States, effective states, are our platform for protecting human dignity, individual rights, rights of groups, conceptions of the good life, liberalism. Everything depends on effective power. And when you don't have effective power, even the most humanistic universal norms, you cannot prevent genocide. Genocide, it's clear that it's terrible. Right? You cannot prevent it. So one of the obligations of a state is to maintain the kind of power that is required in order to, within its territory, maintain this order in a way that will protect the lives, lives and basic welfare of all. And to you, I return with the, your religious minority. Of course you're right. There is a problem. But if you give them individual civil and political rights, no discrimination, full freedom of religion and worship, and the dignity and the equals of citizenship, then it's, you, they're not fully equal because they're not mm -hmm. Muslim. They're not fully equal. You're right. But in the kind of... Ben, you, know, you would have to give up your ability to define your state, which is 95% Muslim, to define it as a Muslim country and contain your own internal divisions just so that they will feel that in principle it's not there. As we were saying before, this is what the Copts are negotiating mm -hmm. in. Egypt, but it's not helping them. Mm -hmm. It's not helping them. It doesn't take away the difference between them and the Muslim majority. It doesn't take away the difference. It's time for, for uh, one more question, um, and it's going to go to Dean Minow. <laughs> <laughs> this is utterly fascinating. A thread in the conversation that's implicit that I'd like to hear your response uh, to making explicit is the tension between the individual and the group. Okay, so you talk about human rights, but you also talk about the demos and that they're a majority. You talk about the French. The French have a strong view about what Frenchness is. Mm -hmm. And you can become French if you give up some other yeah. things. Uh, and if there is, uh, uh, sadly, the word genocide has emerged, what we know is that the drive for purity can be amplified by unscrupulous leaders at any moment using the notion of who's us and who's them. And so if you use the power of the state to reinforce the group, there are two examples that are very hard. One is, can the state's power be used to enforce what is a good Jew, what is a good Muslim, and then what happens to individual rights? That's a problem. And another example is, so what if you end up and it's not a majority of Jews in Israel? So then you take away the rights of equality and, and voting for the citizens who are not Jewish? Those are the two that seem to me they're implicitly, at some point, individual rights versus group. You're going to have to have a trade-off. 
It's good that we're ending on a deep point. Yeah. <laughs> who, who, would like to, who would like to reply? Well, I, I completely agree. I mean, in the case of the Muslim state, you have uh, a threat to individual freedoms. Again, I mean, who is a good Muslim and who is not, right? Look at the penal code of Tunisia. Homosexuality is penalized, right? So um, is a Muslim state ready to uh, remove that from the penal code? That's, that's a big, big question. And this is why, for me, it's not just a question of numbers or of religious minorities. It's a question of principle, right? Mm -hmm. So perhaps it's feasible to have a um, Muslim state that is democratic and that sustains human rights. But then we have to agree on the definition of what Islam is, right? Um, so it's complicated, it's difficult, and it's very important to talk about those difficult issues within a democracy. So I hope the Tunisian um, parliamentarians, uh, civil society members, etc., politicians will grapple with these issues in the coming years. For me, it's extremely important for a healthy democracy to be able to talk about those problems. Well, I, I have well, yes, three, three points. I think that states, both in principle, here I am, principles, and in prudence, should refrain totally from making religious determinations. Refrain totally, irrespective of separation of state and church. It can be custodians and do education, but it is not the matter for the state. It's only the matter for the religious establishment. It is not a matter for the state to draw any implications from the question whether someone is a good or a bad Muslim or Jew or whoever. This is a total mistake, total mistake. Jewish majority is a very, very, very difficult issue. And it, it's partly it's in principle and partly it's in real thing. I think that there are people in Israel, and they part of what scares me, that think that uh, Jews are entitled to have a state of their own even if they lose the majority in it and they will do what it takes to maintain a Jewish state in some senses, including not giving citizenship to all the people in the territory, blah, 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 because it's so important for Jews to have a Jewish state. I, this is where I, I stop streaming with this. I think that uh, a Jewish democracy requires a stable Jewish majority. And I think that Israel needs to make the political decisions that are implied by that decision. And this is how the United Nations created the Jewish state. And this is the first responsibility of any government of the state of Israel is to maintain a Jewish majority. And it can be done. It can be done. So, so I think the two questions are extremely important. And I have questions that I'm not sure my country lives up to, but, uh, but uh, I think at least my answers are, are, are clear. Well, speaking of healthy democracies, we need to repair to our television sets to discover if we live in one. Um, I, a I country would... whose health of democracy depends on the results of election is by definition not healthy. Well, there's our... <laughs> I, I'm glad. I'm glad you're all. I'm glad you're all applauding. But I, that's a pretty depressing thought. Um, I would like just to take the opportunity to thank Ruth from coming for coming all the way from Israel. To thank Malika from coming all the way from Harvard Yard. Uh, to thank all of you from coming thank from the you. places that you came very and for participating in this nice fascinating conversation. Thank you. And to thank Mitch and his family for making it possible. Thank you. Yeah.